motion designer and I teach you how to make motion graphics and animations on my YouTube channel. This year I am going to be a jury member for the MSI 2021 Creator Awards. This year's theme is Tech Meets Aesthetics and I'll be a judge for the graphic design category. So you can submit your graphic designs, your 2D illustrations, your motion graphics and you can win some great prizes featuring some of the wonderful MSI products that you'll see behind me. In this video, I'm going to be breaking down my interpretation of that theme with this animation. But first, I'm going to be answering some jury questions from MSI. What do you do when you lack ideas or inspiration? This happens a lot and normally people give two responses to this, either um, take a break and come back later or just persevere and push your way through it. And those kind of seem like the opposite reaction. So I tend to steer more towards the second. What I like to do is set up a block of time, 60 to 90 minutes or so, and give myself, you know, that space just to think of ideas for a certain topic. Another thing I like to do is give myself a numerical target to hit. So say if I'm designing logos, design 20 logos or design 50 logos, or the time limit can be that barrier. So design logo ideas for 60 minutes. And what I think really helps with this method is that you sort of get all the bad ideas out of the way first, or at least the most obvious ones. So by idea 10, you start to think, oh, I've got 30 more of these to come up with. What can I possibly do? And then you start to make more unique connections and make more interesting and often worse, but oftentimes really good and better ideas as well. And because you give yourself a long period of time or a large number of targets to hit, only one of those ideas needs to be good. So you don't have to worry about every single one being the best idea you've ever had. Could you describe your work in three words? I can try. I'd say fun, textured characters. That's definitely what a lot of my work is. Even though what I'm going to be showing you how to make today isn't probably any of those things, but I wanted to try something different and push myself for this thing. What would you suggest for a beginner to enter this field? Definitely make as much stuff as you can. Don't be too harsh on yourself and really try to focus on spending hundreds and hundreds of hours to make something look the best it can. Try something, enjoy the process, and once it's done, move on to something else and just get a lot of projects under your belt. You're gonna advance your skills a lot faster by making many, many things rather than sitting and thinking and trying to make the one perfect thing. How did you start your career? So I started by studying graphic design at university. I decided I didn't want to be a graphic designer towards the end of that degree because I thought it would be too structured and too limiting. So I tried to pursue illustration as a freelancer for two years. Then I got a job doing um, design and illustration for a video production company for doing, you know, creating the assets for their animations. And then over the two to three years that I was at that company, I slowly learned motion graphics by taking on larger and larger projects. And then after that, I went freelance as a motion designer to take, you know, charge to take the work back into my own hands. And the last year been full-time making content for YouTube as well. So that was my career path. I think pretty much anyone that's gotten into the career in the last five years, or certainly last two years plus, has had a very different entry into this career because it's so new, the motion graphic industry at least. And I think something that really was an advantage for me in learning things in that order was because that I learned design separately from animation. I learned design and then illustration and then animation and motion graphics. And I think that was probably the best order you can learn those in rather than trying to learn them all at once. And that was definitely not something I planned. I just got very lucky, but planning it that way was not my intention. How long does it take to complete a project? The longest projects that I've been on have taken, you know, months, up to six months. And the shortest ones within a couple of hours. Most of what I do now is for a weekly um, YouTube tutorial, so I can't spend too much time on them. I like to spend around two days, probably four to six hours on animation if I can. And the one I'm gonna break down today probably took around four to six hours. What are your hobbies? Well, I think I like all the standard hobbies, like uh, watching TV, watching a series, watching a film. I also like reading. I am a sci-fi and fantasy enthusiast. I'm reading Brandon Sanderson at the moment. I've just started the Mistborn trilogy and I'm enjoying that. Also enjoy video games, very much enjoying Hades at the moment, and also painting. I've been trying to get back into acrylic painting just to take myself away from the computer for a little bit longer and find a hobby that isn't, you know, staring at a screen. So acrylic painting, that's something I'm trying. So hopefully you can see more of that in my work soon. Who is your favorite content creator? At the moment, Internet Historian is my favorite content creator. He has a YouTube channel where he creates these animated sort of small documentaries, I guess, and they're really hilarious. There's very much 
a sensibility of that you know internet humor because it's breaking down sort of historical events on the internet and sometimes outside that but the animation all takes sort of stock footage and found elements and it's animated really crudely you might say but hilariously that definitely works to the tone that he's going for and they're just really awesome I'd definitely check them out what kind of entries will catch your eye and make an impression definitely something that's more unique and creative if there's something that sort of takes me by surprise and makes me think ah oh, I wouldn't have thought of interpreting the theme that way that is normally a big plus I'm going to enjoy being surprised and I like having the rug pulled from underneath me so entries like that please. what do you think is the most important element in an artwork I think definitely the design I'm Assuming it has a good idea, the design is definitely more important, especially motion graphics than the animation or really the final execution to make it look super polished. Because if the original design is good, it doesn't matter how little or how sort of basic the animation is, you're still looking at something that looks great. Whereas if you design something not very well or don't take much time, and you put all your effort into the animation, it's going to be moving all over the place and have great motion. But you're still left looking at something that isn't that good. So Design is definitely something that I preference. How do you select your hardware for work? I mainly choose hardware now based on how much time it will save me and how much stress it will save me. And if something can do both of those things, I'll pay pretty much any price. That's a good investment for something they are gonna be using all day, every day, which in my career, that's definitely what I'm doing. Also, it has to look good. If it doesn't look good, that might be an issue, especially if you're looking at it, even if it's in your peripherals, if you're doing that for eight hours a day, it's gonna get on your nerves. So if I can see it, it needs to look nice. Nice and sleek and minimal um, is my preference. What do you usually do in your free time? I have probably all of those hobbies I did earlier, but also taking my little dog kimchi out for a walk. So the theme is tech meets aesthetics. And when I think of aesthetics, I think of trends. The way we look at something and appreciate its value aesthetically, often changes with the times. Like throughout history, men have all had beards and then someone decides, I've had enough of beards, I'm going clean shaven. And then after a few years, someone decides, I've had enough of clean shaven, we're having beards again. And those follow suit and they sort of ebb and flow. And you know, pro we're probably in a high beard population at the moment, but these trends are gonna you know, depreciate once we hit a, a critical mass. And you see these cycles and trends in a lot of things, even in music progressive rock got more complicated and noodly so then punk rock was a response to that and then that was maybe a bit too simple so post rock was a response to that and these things sort of ebb and flow whereas technology technology just keeps progressing getting more and more complicated getting more and more a part of our lives and really the only thing that changes about the nature of technology besides of you know how how more ever increasing a part of our lives it is is the aesthetics of it the aesthetics do change with trends. For a while, it might be all minimalist, and then as a response to that, the new tech is gonna look more complicated and more science fiction-like. So I wanted to represent this sort of with some abstract shapes in a motion graphics piece. So let's have a look at the final animation. So I've represented the cyclic nature of aesthetics with this shape morph here, changing from this circle, which morphs into this square that is made out of four squashed and warped circles into this sort of starry pointy shape. And then I'm taking this animation and then in a main comp, sort of reversing it in and out. So it turns from the circle into the square and then back into the circle again. But each time it does that, it gets smaller and smaller and there are more and more multiple versions of that shape and that's to represent the growing complexity of technology so as we pull back it reveals how more and more complex it is each time this cycle these trends repeat themselves now this does make me feel a little bit like i'm back at uni trying to explain my concepts and pitching them to the tutors so let's just get stuck in and make the animation now i created this working on the msi creator 17 a blazing fast machine with a gorgeous chassis if i don't say so myself and alongside it the prestige ps 34 one wu a 34 inch ultra wide monitor it's massive it's super sleek and has a ridiculous screen with a level of color accuracy that i can't truly say that i fully understand now I love working on the ultra wide monitor. It gives me so much room on my timeline, especially in After Effects. But for the purposes of this screen recording, I'm going to make it on the laptop screen so the aspect ratio doesn't get all shrunken down and harder to see. Now, the first thing that I did after sketching out my idea on some paper was to find a color palette. 
Now I struggle with color, especially when there's an endless range to choose from. So I decided to start from this, this branding image from the Creator Awards. So I dropped all the colors out of this design and then in a new document documented all of them. There was more than I thought and then reduced them down. So I'm just picking one color from each of the hues here. And I saved this artboard out as an image so that I could eye drop them easily from After Effects. Speaking of which, let's jump in and get animated. So here's that palette that I've imported in just as a PNG and we're gonna start creating our animation in a new composition. And in that we're gonna create our basic morphing shape that we're gonna use as the building blocks for the rest of the piece. So let's create a new comp, let's call it Shape01. Let's leave it at 1080 by 1080 and two seconds long, 24 frames per second should be fine. Now let's create a circle in the middle with our ellipse tool, holding shift so it creates a perfect circle as we drag it out. And then let's choose a color from our color palette. So let's select it so it's visible up here. Select the fill and then just eye drop this nice teal color. Let's hit OK and let's check out its size. Let's make it a bit smaller. Let's make it 350 pixels wide. There and let's rename that to circle one. Now there will be four of these circles in this animation, but let's just start by animating one and it'll be easier to duplicate after we've already got some animation on it. First, we're gonna adjust its scale. So let's open up S on our keyboard. Let's keyframe it at one second here. I'm also gonna add a pucker and bloat, which you'll be able to find by toggling down here and selecting add and select pucker and bloat. And at the moment you can see that it starts warping our circle here. And if we look down, it has an amount of 10 in the pucker and bloat. So it's bloating outwards by 10 pixels, uh, maybe 10%. And if we click and drag this, you can see how if you drag to the left, negative numbers turn into a pointy star and on the right, positive numbers sort of push it outwards and then it becomes kind of a flower shape and then back into another pointy star shape. And this will be the first thing we animate. So let's keyframe that at zero. Let's press U on our keyboard to hide all the other properties that we don't need to see. And then about 12 frames later, let's take that to minus 100. And that pretty much makes it as pointy as you can get without it sort of overlapping on itself. And I do have to shout out Johan Eriksson for introducing me to this technique in his awesome star tutorial. So now I've got our circle turning into our star. And let's give this some easing. So let's press F9 on our keyboard to ease this last keyframe. Let's go into our graph editor and just make that a bit steeper. There, that's a much better motion. Let's get out of the graph editor. And now let's duplicate this a few more times. So let's duplicate it three times with Control or Command D on our keyboard. And I'm gonna reorder these, so circle one is at the top. Now I do wanna give these circles all a bit of variety. So let's open up their scale properties. Circle two, I wanna scale it to 150%. And let's change the color from this teal and I drop this dark blue. Circle three, let's scale up another 50% to 200%. And this one, we want a gradient fill. So let's click on fill, choose gradient fill, open up the gradient options. And let's iron up some colors from our palette. First, let's go this pink and then a yellow. And then this last one, let's choose a very pale orange. Now let's select our arrow tool so we can adjust our gradient settings and just drag this bar until our gradient sort of extends all the way across the circle there. And then circle four, Let's scale that up to 250% and let's just color this one in blue. Great, so now we've got our four circles and then they all get very pointy at the end. But I don't want all of these to be that pointy. Let's select them all, press U on our keyboard to bring up our pucker and bloat amounts and let's decrease these. And I'm doing this because a lot of interest I find in animation comes from variety. If there's some slight differences in the speed that something's animating or if it's offset slightly, it tends to add more interest certainly to me. So let's see if we can get this more interesting by adjusting our amounts of pucker and bloat. So our circles are all increasing by 50%. So let's try and decrease the amount of pucker and bloat. So the first one is minus 100. Let's go to minus 75. And the next one, minus 50. And the next one, minus 25. And that one's almost looking like a square now. And also I've noticed all of these are slightly off center. So if we select them all, let's just open up our line tool align to composition and then to put them firmly in the middle. There, now we've got our circles turning into this square shape with our puckered stars in the middle. Now let's add some variety to the speed. And we can do that just by changing the distance between these keyframes. So the first one will make faster. So I'll drag that closer to the first keyframe and the others I will drag a bit further back. So then now our first circle starts being pointier much sooner. And it kind of looks as though the points as it comes out are kind of pushing the other layers outwards into that final sort of pointy square shape. There, now let's animate the scale. Now we want them to scale down from one big circle to reveal all of these colors. So we start off thinking it's just one flat colored circle, and then we get a nice reveal of these little rainbow colors and then into this cool star shape. So the easiest way to do that is to scale them up to the size of this circle, the biggest one, which is 250. 
So if I just select the top three and I can change all of their scales at once by just typing in 250. And there we are, we all turn into that large circle. Now if we play, they all shrink down and turn into our stars. Let's add some easing on those two with F9. Let's make that a bit more severe in the graph editor. There, that's looking good. But I think I want to stagger this a bit like we did our pucker and bloats at the end here. So I'm going to drag these further towards the middle. So we get a bit of a delayed start in our first circle. It starts animating much before the others. Nice. Now one thing that we could make smoother is to add some more sort of overlap between these two motions. Because at the moment it scales down and at one second it's this shape and then they all turn into our stars, which looks fine. We could turn that more into sort of that one smooth motion and that is by staggering it even more in the middle. So maybe this first circle starts transforming into our star shape before it even finishes scaling down. Same with our second shape. And then our third shape is maybe a little bit later and then our fourth one later still. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. The only thing I don't like is we have one frame where our first star is poking out further than the next circle, which I don't quite want. So I'm just gonna drag this keyframe forward one so that our second circle starts puckering a bit sooner. So then we don't get that overlap. And now it's pretty consistent that the spikes are all just sort of poking into the next layer of circle and pushing it out. Great. Now that's almost done. And there's two small things that we can do to elevate this animation just a little bit more. And that's by adding a bit of a scale animation to the thing as a whole. Because to me, even though they're probably taking up the same amount of area, the circle here and this square form at the end don't look the same size. This square looks a bit bigger. So I think maybe we could scale the whole thing down a touch and maybe add a bit of rotation as it happens as well. And we can apply that easily to the whole thing using a null. So let's go up to layer, new, null object, which will create one in the middle. And a null is essentially a blank layer that won't show up in a final render, but we can use it to manipulate the other layers in our composition. So let's select all of our layers and using the pick whip, parent them to this null object. I'm just gonna call this master shape null. So now if we grab this null object and move it around, it affects our whole animation. And if we scale it up and down, everything we do to it affects all of our other layers. So let's undo that. And now let's actually keyframe the scale and rotation. So in the middle, let's keyframe its scale here and its rotation. And then at the end, let's scale it down from 100 to say 80% and its rotation to 45. So now the square is all lined up. And to me, that makes it look you know, a bit squarer. So now it has a little spin as it rotates. But now let's go in and add some easing to the movements a bit smoother. Let's select all of those keyframes on the null, press F9 to easy ease them. Let's go into the graph editor. Let's maybe go into the speed graph. We want to add a whole bunch of easing on the right side and maybe a little less on the left. Let's maybe move these keyframes a little further to the left as well. So where our graph is highest and, and lowest, where there's the biggest deviation from zero here, where it's the fastest is right in the middle of our animation, where things start kicking off and turning into our squared star shape. There, it doesn't look like the rotation is maybe going a bit too far. We do want it to still end up as a square though. So at the start, let's change its rotation from zero to 25 because it's a circle anyway, so it doesn't really matter where our circle starts rotating from. There, I think that's done. So now we've got our main shape animation completed. And this is pretty much the majority of the animation done for this piece. The rest is just duplicating it with some creative effects and you know finding ways to zoom in and out of it. So on to the next part. So now let's tackle the rest. Let's create a new comp. This time we want it to be 1920 wide by 1080. And let's make this eight seconds long because we want four instances of this shape animating. First, let's create a new solid with control Y and it'll default to the last color we selected, which is a pale orange solid, which is exactly what we want, which is what we I dropped early from that gradient in our circle. Let's just call that background and we can drop in our shape 01 comp. I'm gonna zoom out a bit and then make sure it is all centered. Now we're gonna duplicate our shape one with control command D. I'm gonna slide it over. So it's gonna play immediately after this one. And of course we have a big jump here in our square to our circle. So let's right click, select time and time reverse layer. So it's gonna to get to this point and then reverse back into our circle. They're like the cycle of our trends, which is what our concept is all about. Now I'm gonna drag the end of my work area here to four seconds in the end of this comp. So now if we play it, they should all loop. Excellent. Now let's add some motion to create more of a transition. So each comp we want to get smaller. So let's actually uh, scale this comp down a bit. And we'll fine tune this later. So we want there to be a bit of a transition between these two here. And we also want the animation to be consistent across what will be all four of our scenes. 
And the easiest way to do that is again with a null. So let's create a new null object. This one we can trim to just the width of this layer and we compare it in this comp to this null object. And I think again, we're gonna scale the two properties, scale and rotation. So let's open up scale with S and R with, and rotation with R on our keyboard and about 12 frames into this uh, null object. Let's have those keyframes at zero and 100 for now. 12 frames before the end, keyframe them again. And now we can add the starting position. So let's have it start scale up at the start. So it goes from 115, 115% to 100. So it scales down the touch. And then at the end, I wanted to scale down that same amount. So in the very last frame, let's scale it down to 85%. There. And let's easy ease these middle keyframes with F9 on our keyboard. So now we can see in that transition, there's a scaling down motion. And then as we transition again, another scaling down. So it's gonna continue scaling down onto the next one. And we'll do that at the same speed, no matter how big the scale of this one is. So we can make it larger. And in all the transitions, it's gonna start just scaling down a fair bit. All right, now let's do the same with the rotation. So we actually want it to be 45 degrees in the middle here. So I'm gonna keyframe those. So then it becomes this diamond shape. And so I want the rotation to be a bit subtler than the scale. So let's only go 10 degrees. Let's go 35 degrees. And at the end, 55 degrees. And let's maybe go into the graph editor as well and add a bit more of an easing on these here. There, I think that's looking good. So now as it transitions in, it rotates clockwise and scales down. And as it rotates out, it rotates clockwise again and scales out. But of course we can't see the rotation because it's a circle here. Now to apply that to our first comp, we just need to duplicate this null object, put it above the first composition we have here. And then when we get to the middle, or at least anywhere between these two middle keyframes, just grab our pick whip and pick whip this comp to that null. So now we can see a lot more clear in the transition that it's scaling down and rotating in between each one. And because all of that animation is happening with the null object, we can do whatever we want with these base comps here. We can scale these really far down. We can change the rotation of these and that won't affect how fast it scales down or how fast it rotates in this transition. That's gonna be consistent across all of our scenes of which there'll be four. And this just gives us more flexibility. So now let's duplicate all of these layers here, except for our background, duplicate them with control or command plus D. Let's move them to the top of the layer stack by pressing control shift and right square bracket, and then drag them over to the right so we can fill up our comp. And now we have four copies of this one shape animation. Now we get to add all of the multiple versions of this shape layer in that grid formation. So let's start with our second scene. And we're gonna create all of those duplicates by adding the effect motion tile. So let's search for that in here, motion tile, drag that onto our layer. And all we need to do is increase the output width and the output height. So let's increase the width. And what it will do is just mirror whatever we have in this comp and sort of duplicate it further outwards. And then same with its height as well. There we are, we're just dragging this out until it fills our screen and we have multiple versions. Now to me, it does look like these are a bit too close together for my liking. And an easy way to fix that is to just go into this comp and increase the size of the composition. So let's press Command K and increase that from 1080 to 1600 on both the height and the width. There we are. So now there's a bit more buffer, a bit more margin or padding in this shape. And that should be communicated in our motion tile. There we are, much further spread out. I think that is a bit nicer. So now if we adjust the scale of this layer, we can decide how many of these sort of duplicate versions we want visible at one time. So now in the overall story, we want each of these different scales of pulling out to tell the audience something new. So the first one, we want them to just focus on the one shape, thinking, oh, there's a shape transforming. I wonder if this is perhaps an allegory to the changing nature of technology getting more complex while there's trends happening as well. That's what we want from the first one. In the second one, we just want the audience to think, oh wow, there's more of these. If we went straight to showing 100 more of them, we would lose the impact when we show more and more later and later on. We don't wanna show our cards all at once. So for scene two, let's just show the minimum that we can do, which is just to see an extra one visible on each side. Then I think a scale of 47 works quite well for that. Let's just see how that plays leading in from scene one. There, I think that works well. Now in the third scene, we've already seen that there's multiple of these shapes. In scene three, we wanna say, hey, there is a lot of these shapes here. So what we can do is first, let's just copy and paste the motion tile from our shot two, paste it over here, and let's scale this one down a lot. Let's scale this all the way down to maybe 20%. Now in this formation, they look a lot like a grid, which looks okay, but I think we can make it a bit more interesting to look at. And that is by adjusting the phase here. 
So if we start dragging the phase, you can see that it offsets every other row. And if I increase that to 180 degrees, each row will be put sort of in between the other row and we get a bit more of a sort of hexagonal shaped grid here. And to me, that just reads as being just a little less obvious than that full square grid, especially when you have more numbers like this. And you also might want to select mirror edges as well. And if you do that, that will reflect every other instance of our original shape one layer here. So there's a bit more variety. Might do that on shot two as well, hit mirror edges. There, I think that's looking good. I think I want to scale these down a bit more, maybe from 20%, maybe down to 14. There, so now we get a whole bunch on screen. Now, one thing you may notice is that this is a lot more hardware intensive to render all of these than it was just our first one. And that is because After Effects is not only rendering just one, it is rendering, you know, at this point, dozens and dozens of this shape at one point. Now, at the moment, this is tolerable. You can always lower your resolution if you need to. But in the next shot, we are going to have to show a lot more instances of this shape and that will slow it down even more. But there is a little trick that we can do to make that easier. And that is to reduce the size of this original comp because that original comp was 1600 pixels by 1600 pixels. But even in our third shot, which is gonna be larger than our fourth shot, these are maybe a few hundred pixels wide. So it doesn't need to be that large at all. So what we're gonna do is duplicate shape one over here in our project window, with control command D. And then in shape two, we're just gonna press Control K or Command K and take the width down from 1600 to 160. Same with the height and then hit OK. So now it is 10% smaller. And now of course our shapes are much bigger than this comp and we can barely see any motion happening in there. So we need to scale these all down. And because we have this null already made, we can just select these scale keyframes and make sure the scale goes from instead of 100% to 10%. And then the last one should be 8% because it used to be 8%. There we are. So now we have a miniaturized version of this shape layer comp. So now let's go back into our main comp. And for our last shot, our fourth shot, let's select shape two, hold alt or option on our keyboard and just drag that onto that layer. So now it will replace that layer with the much smaller version, which doesn't matter too much to us at all because it's gonna be even smaller. So let's now copy and paste that motion tile effect onto this layer. Let's increase the output width way more. Same with the height. And let's scale it down even further. At the moment it's 50%. Let's get down to 40. We can do even more. Let's get down to 30%. There. And now let's increase that output width again and height because we need to make sure it fills all of our screen. Wonderful. And that is much quicker to RAM preview as well because RFX isn't having to think about so many more pixels. Now, one thing I have noticed is in this transition here, as we zoom out of our shot three, we can see the edges of some shapes here. So that means we're not expanded further enough. So let's increase the output width there. So that should fill all of them. Let me just make sure that is the same for shot one. I think we are. And the end of shot four as well. Ah, in this last frame, we do have some more gaps. So let's increase the width and height just a bit more there. Now there's no empty spots in any of our transitions. Let's see how it all looks together. There, I think that is looking pretty good. There is one thing that I think we can do just to make it a little bit more seamless though. And that is this last transition here. So at the end, when we're transitioning from this big screen of all of these dots, and then it zooms out, and then we get just our one big teal circle at the beginning. It would be awesome if that transition was a bit more seamless. And one way I think we can do that is to increase the size of these circles here. So that this last end frame here is mostly green. That way when we cut to this green circle here or this teal circle and it zooms out it will kind of look like we're zooming infinitely in onto that so there's an easy way we can do that which is just by increasing the scale of the circle and now this comp here has been reversed so the last keyframe here will be the first keyframe so let's just go into this comp i've already got our scale null in here so let's change its scale at the start from 10 percent to let's just scroll it up until we yeah around where we hit the edges of this comp here, 18%. Let's get back into our main comp. How does that look? Let's just scrub through the last few frames at the end here. At the end, they almost fill the screen. So let's see how that looks. There, I think that's just a little bit better. It makes it seem like those little circles are all coming together and are actually just, you know, a small part of that big one circle at the beginning. So we get a nice infinite recursion to our loop as well. Now, the very last thing to do, which is absolutely optional, is to create a new adjustment layer with Control Alt Y and add the effect Posterize Time. Let's drag this onto here and set the frame rate from 24 frames per second down to 12. 
And this may seem bizarre if you're not um, used to this in animation, but what this does is just lower the frame rate. And it lowers it to a frame rate which you would see more with traditional hand-drawn animation. And to me, this makes it seem just a little more tactile and a bit less smooth and clean in digital. But that's entirely up to you. You might want a smooth, clean digital look for this. And if you want that, go right ahead. This is just a personal preference. So this is my interpretation of tech meets aesthetics. I hope you found this information useful and don't forget to submit your work to the MSI 2021 Creator Awards. I'll be judging the graphic design category. So submit your work, your graphic designs, your illustrations, your animations, whatever you make, and you can win some great prizes like this MSI laptop here, this monitor, and I can't wait to see your submissions. Thank you.